specific, just a little small uh, account. This is about, um, this one is about uh, this, this character, Maximus, who shows up in St. Gregory's life. The extraordinary and bizarre account of Maximus, a plausible adventurer and huckster, <laughs> and how he came into St. Gregory's life, we shall relate briefly. Maximus was a former cynic philosopher who converted to Christianity. St. Gregory later described him as a dandy of dubious sex, a street lounger, an inarticulate nuisance, and a raging pest. See the trouble we had? He thought himself a person of consequence. He would preen himself meticulously and gave special attention to the abundance of curls that fell about his shoulders. Was he fair or dark, curly or straight-haired? St. Gregory remarks that he had been one way, but recently he contrived to look another way. The coffer's heart could do him all over again. He was a woman in hairstyle and a man by reason of the staff. With the recommendation of the Alexandrian church, he arrived in Constantinople and attached himself to the Orthodox. It happened that he got involved with a scheme for financial gain. A priest had come from Thassos with a purse full of money. He was sent by the church at Thassos to Constantinople for the purchase of Proconesian tiles. With stealth, Maximus coaxed him, won him over as an accomplice for a scheme he was about to perpetrate. He misled that unhappy and deceived priest with all kinds of words and pledges. Maximus also persuaded another priest in St. Gregory's flock to betray the hierarch. St. Gregory later speaks of that particular man, saying he had never been overlooked or suffered any rebuff, but on the contrary, he had always held first place in honor and dignity. In the meantime, Maximus slyly won the favor and confidence of St. Gregory. He then bribed some other confederates, namely Egyptian bishops, including one of Gregory's clerics, and planned to have Gregory ousted and have himself install his picture. The arrival of the Egyptian fleet gave him further support. Gregory happened to fall sick during that time, so the deceivers planned to carry out the enthronement at night. Gregory describes the scene in a poem about his own life. At night, when I was indisposed, like thieving wolves in the fold, they suddenly made their appearance, bringing a gang of hirelings from the fleet. Indeed, the sort who might make a typical Alexandrian model. Continuing, he says, they with the sailors burst into the church without any previous notice to the congregation or the staff of the church, and certainly not to myself, who deserved at least a dog's treatment. They were bent on consecrating maximums, and even alleged that they had been commissioned to act this way. St. Gregory then says that dawn came. The clergy living nearby grew agitated, and the news spread quickly. A tumult ensued with a large concourse of magistrates, magistrates, strangers, and riffraff. They were foiled, but refused to abandon their purpose, even though during the consecration service they were driven from the church by a maddened flock. They repaired to the house of some flute player, where they finished the ceremony. There was no time to bind him as they tortured him or use any pressure. Ono Maximus was quite willing to presume upon higher things. Only, only the coxcomb was undone by having his hair shorn. The cynic was then proclaimed pastor. Quote, the city straightway was convulsed. Everyone was furious. Bitter accusations flooded in about his manner of life. The poor shorn dog was deprived of his beautiful hair and a flock to administer. Unquote. If it had not been for St. Gregory's intercession with the flock, Maximus would have been seriously hurt. Gregory admits that the ignorance I displayed with regard to Maximus deserves censure. For a trusting person is the easiest in the world to persuade, since he is impulsively drawn to goodness, real or counterfeit. St. Gregory discloses that when Maximus came to him from Egypt, he did not know that his exile was for misdemeanors. For Maximus represented himself to Gregory as one suffering banishment for the Lord's sake. And though he was a rascal, he was made to appear as a hero to the Holy Hierarch. Later he admits he was in fact a reprobate, but I respected him as a decent man. He then asks, if decent treatment fails to sweeten a person, is there anything else under the sun that could work? For in very truth, my kindness to him constitutes his reproach. The commotion moved Gregory to retire into solitude. 
Yet, in fact, it made him more popular with his flock. He did suffer, however, considerable negative comment for his gullibility and the manner in which he had been misled by the cynic impostor. But the gospel tells us to show love to all. Christ also says, the one who comes to me in no wise will I cast out. St. Gregory said, do not be angry with me in that I have done good to this man, failing to anticipate his craftiness. Are we to be guilty of failing to foresee someone's evil predisposition? Sure, only God is able to know the secrets of the heart. Are we not commanded by his law to open our hearts to all who come to us? For it was important to me that Maximus leave his error and begin to worship the Holy Trinity. He appeared virtuous, although now I know it was hypocrisy. We cannot penetrate the thoughts of man. We do not know the future. Unquote. St. Gregory also suffered from critics who reproved his simple life and his serene demeanor. In fact, St. Gregory was more than willing to retire, but he was prevented by the sincere protestations of his friends. Indeed, when the congregation learned of his wish to retire, they cried out in protest. Men, women, girls, boys, old people, nobles, common folk, magistrates, soldiers on furlough. They truly believed that if Gregory left, the faith might depart with him. He observes, there I stood before them, speechless, beset by darkness. I neither could repress their shouting or promise anything that they requested. He then says that it was very hot, stifling hot, with perspiration pouring down. The children were crying, mothers were hoarse in the panic. The flock refused to abandon their efforts, even if it meant dying in their tracks, in the church itself. They protested, tell us then, art thou going to have the Trinity cast out with thyself? Gregory says that he panicked, lest something awful should occur. He acceded to their remnant remonstrances until, as he said, a fitter individual should be found. I swore no oath, he says. I said I would stay on until some of the bishops arrived, thinking that then I might extricate myself from this anxious situation. I really thought my stay would be brief. He himself commented he was not one to bend the knee to pressure or to accept authority unless lawfully bestowed, but he also admitted, I could not even be forced to accept it when it was lawful. And how true that was, we know from his past. Meanwhile, the wretched Maximus and the Egyptian rabble exited the city. They betook themselves to the camp of the Eastern Emperor Theodosius while he was on an offensive against barbarian tribes in Thessaloniki. Maximus again attempted to instigate intrigues. He hoped to secure for himself a sea by imperial decree. Theodosius cast him out like a dog and a rogue scampered off to Egypt. So, this is a big story. It's like pages and pages, but the bottom line to the, the beautiful life of St. Gregory the Theologian, as with many of the, you know, the real fathers and pastors and teachers of the church, is that they were unwilling they were not really willing to be leaders. This is the important concept, you know, like in the church. Like with they, they have to like be totally, absolutely secure in the knowledge that this is blessed by God. And in fact, the Lord is insisting that it happen. And then they bow their head, you know, in obedience. But before that, anybody who wants to be a leader, right, we should take uh, we should take example of this in this so-called democracy of ours, you know. So anybody who wants to be a leader, run away from them. If they say, I can be a leader, just turn and run in the other direction. Why? Because opposite from these kinds of men, these kinds of saints, it's driven by the pride, you know, of, of the spirit that they have. Whereas the real leader, and I'm not just talking about in the church, by the way. If you think about it, any emperor, any general, any like world leader who was benevolent, like did not want the job, but it was foisted upon them, you know, and they took on the mantle of that big burden of leadership and in an army or in a country or whatever, all of a sudden they became like the best leader, the one that, because here's what happens. Because of the sincerity of heart, and this is for all of you too, not just leadership, but even in life, right? When, you, when you're given a task in obedience, when you, when you finally take it on, and they say, okay, and I can hear them say, okay, but you ask for it, basically, because when they become leaders, they become real leaders. They can't be bribed, they can't be bought, they can't be like, persuaded falsely, whatever. 
they know the truth of their high calling. And so, they're leaders to the end. And then they oftentimes, like St. Gregory, get thrown out. Or like St. John Chrysostom, get killed in exile. You know, thrown out and, and dragged all over in chains. Why? Because he exercised the leadership of the church that he didn't even want in the first place. See? But when they get the job, they say, I have to do the job. I'm not just going to like fluff through it lazily or just sort of on the surface. I have to do this job. And since the Lord gave me this job and no person, no people, right? But always we, we receive that blessing from God. I have to do it like even if it kills me. Even if like the people like Gregory became the most unpopular, like <coughs> many of the bishops and the saints of the church became very unpopular because they look into the eyes of like a, a king or an emperor or somebody or in the eyes of even the people of the community. And they tell them the truth. <laughs> God forbid. They told them the truth. And they said, we don't want to hear that out with you. That's, you know. So, welcome to the church. Welcome to the church. Why? Our Master Jesus Christ told the truth. And look what he got for it. Alright? Hear that? Now, who among us wants to be different than Christ? Here's a big, a big lesson for us. Don't skimp on the truth. I mean, don't skimp on love either. But don't skimp on the truth. Don't be the double dealing inside of our own hearts and souls. We'll never become people like of the stature of this if we have what's best, what's in it for me, and what's best for me, and how can I avoid hurt, and how can I avoid like discomfort and all the rest of it. See, men will never have peace. We will never have the, all the peace that we're seeking and the comfort and all the rest. It will elude us forever. The minute we have this fidelity to the exact ministry that Christ gave me, and he gave you a ministry for a Christian father, Christian mother, Christian husband, <coughs> Christian brother, Christian man, Christian woman. It's a big ministry. You have to, like it's a, a big office. You know, it's like an office like a bishop, like the, the Archbishop Gregory. You have to look at it the same, you know, with the same hmm, fidelity. Like, just because many people don't notice necessarily like you would notice in his case, do you think that God doesn't notice? This is the key. He notices every way that we're conducting our ministry. So your ministry is no less important than, for instance, the priest ministry. Deacon's ministry, the bishop's ministry. It's the same ministry. It's just different, you know, like functions within that ministry. So you do it with joy, with love, but with all kind of seriousness to the truth. So that it's not a game and it's not about us. It's always about the rest. Okay? That's why we have such fondness and admiration for these holy ones. Because, like, in the middle of all of it, all they could say was, okay, Lord, you put me here, so now, you know, here's what's going to have to happen. I'm going to have to say this thing. I'm going to have to do this thing. I'm going to have to declare this thing. And I know that they're going to cut my head off for it. Thank you for that beautiful gift to celebrate your suffering with my own suffering. To share in your passion with my own passion. You know? <sighs> to be a Christian. Through the prayers of St. Mary, the theologian. Lord Jesus Christ.